Hi everyone and welcome to another exciting, exciting edition of the Digital Masterclass series. I'm your host, Terry Carell. So over the past few weeks, we have spoken about brand building, about applying strategic business planning, and we've even spoken about digital transformation. But let's talk about making that money, right? Money moves. Let's face it, we can't have a masterclass series and not speak about money management. We've seen how the pandemic has affected all of us and how we've had to shuffle around our money. So that means that money management isn't just optional, it is absolutely necessary. And at this stage, we're forced not only to, uh, not, not only to survive, but to thrive. As usual, we want to thank each and every one of you who registered for the Digital Masterclass series. And of course, you visited digitalbusiness.com. One of you or some of you will be lucky enough to get some of our masters to mentor you. And as usual, we invite you to send your questions in. We want your, your commentary. We want to definitely have your participation. Just ensure that you use the hashtag Digicel Masterclass, hashtag Digicel Business. We got a lot of questions last week, and I know when it comes to money, we're going to have a lot of questions on this episode. So to do this, we need Money Management Master to help us. And of course, to help us, we'll be joined by Gary Peart, Chief Executive Officer of Mayberry Investments. He comes with over 20 years extensive experience in corporate finance and wealth management. He was first appointed to the Board of Directors of Mayberry Investments in April 2006. He serves as Chairman of Supreme Ventures Limited and is a director on several other boards including Lasco Financial Services Limited, Lasco Distributors Limited, and Iron Rock Insurance Company Limited. He holds an MBA from Florida International University and a BSc honorable, uh, honors, honors, excuse me, in economics from the University of the West Indies, Mono. He was also honored by several professional and trade organizations and was named top CEO in Jamaica in 2015. We can think of no other person to really provide a solid guidance and the expertise that we need to talk about money management. So at this time, the masterclass is now in session. Get your pens, get your paper, get your notepads, because you're definitely going to get a lot of nuggets from Gary. Welcome. Thank you, Terry. How are you? I'm good. Whenever people see you, they just say money, don't it? Not really. No? <laughs> but do no. they always ask you, like, since, you know, you're, you're, you're an, an expert or you're considered a guru, people just always want to find out, you know, what you think about the next investment opportunity or how they should invest? No, I think when they see my belly, they ask me what is good to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Well, welcome to the show. Welcome to the thank show. Thank you. Thank you for they having me. They told me that you're going to come with your humor and your wit, and I'm very happy to have you. So they say our relationship with money is formed when we are very young, um, with lessons we learn from our parents. How, do you, how true do you think that is? Um, that would be true if it happens on a regular basis, especially mm -hmm. here in Jamaica. So one of the things I'll do, I'll, I'll try and tailor my responses to what I've seen throughout my life and what happens in Jamaica. Please do. And unfortunately, I don't think there are enough parents in Jamaica who actually start to teach their kids about money, managing money, and having a relationship with money. Mm -hmm. And so what you find is that a lot of people who actually do very well actually had certain innate beliefs and skills that you know, manifests itself at an older age. And mm -hmm. they become entrepreneurs, they become very good managers, et cetera. Um, so it would be true if that was the case. But as I said, my experience has been, you know, not many people in Jamaica do it. And I think if you want to have a transformational change in the country, tomorrow morning, if every single parent started to give their children at least one hour a month, mm -hmm. just to start, um, about what is money? Right. How do you save? How do you invest? How do you control expenses? What is important to say? And how do we budget, for example? Yeah, and, and, and budgeting is also critical. So let me ask you a question. A lot of persons say that uh, from young, most of us, um, or at least some of us, get the opportunity to have our parents talk to us about saving. Put on a little money, save, but we yes. don't ever necessarily understand the yield, the returns, mm -hmm. investments. Yep. Um, what do you think about that? And, and that's correct. You know, so one of the things I say to people, you know, invest, don't save. You know, so you're investing to make a return. Mm -hmm. And what we have to appreciate is that in the world today, the system that exists, you know, the best place to be is an owner. Yes. An owner is who owns the business, and their capital is, is magnified by the work of the employees. 
So ultimately, not everybody is born into an ownership environment. Correct. You might have to work as an employee before you get your capital to become your own owner and mm -hmm. continue down that road. So one of the things, and again, it comes back to, it's not innate in the majority of people that I see. There are very few people that do it, whereby they teach their kids from a very, very early age right. about the intricacies of money. And I find that there are two reasons for that. There are some people who genuinely don't really know and don't try to know. So there's a lack of knowledge, a so lack there, of awareness. There's a lack of knowledge, and obviously there's no parent that wants to make their kids feel as though they're not as knowledgeable as they should be, which sure. we can understand. Um, but then it brings us to the second point in that even if you don't know everything, try and build a relationship with somebody who does. You know, so we're going to get into a conversation about financial advisors and the mm -hmm. importance of financial advisors, etc. And that's extremely important because at first I can say that I came from a household where savings was everything. Right. Just save. Put on your money and save and save. And even when persons came around me speaking about investment, I didn't want to hear it. I thought of investment as something that could not resonate with me. It was not relatable. These are right. rich people. You know, you look at investments right. as something that is completely right. far-fetched and that I'd need three gazillion dollars. This is how it always felt yes. to me. And it wasn't until I started to move closely with friends who started to invest, right. who saw the benefits of investing, then I said, okay, I'll definitely do it. But if I wasn't moving around, as you rightfully said, with persons mm -hmm. who could really give me solid advice, yeah. I just didn't see it as something for me. Yes. So, I mean, I can give you a simple example. Eh? You know, so you're correct. A lot of people tell you that you should think about saving, you know. So if you took your money and you put it into the savings account mm -hmm. of a commercial bank, and mm -hmm. there are a couple of them that are listed, <laughs> and instead of putting that $10,000 a month in a savings account at a commercial bank and earn 1% or 2%, but well, you took that $10,000 and bought the stock of the commercial bank where you become a part owner of that bank, you would find if you did this over the last 10 to That's what I 10 to 15 years, you would be a million times better off. That's you know, so learned. putting your money in that savings account, mm -hmm. which is relatively passive, will give you will always give you a return that's significantly less than investing in ownership and equity. It took me a while, but as soon as I understood about that ownership right. and understanding how you can, uh, there's so much more at stake that you can become a part of. I was, I was absolutely sold, and I right. want to thank Ryan Strong because he was the one who, who dragged me into it, and I'm very happy that he did. What are some of the money, the early lessons that you learned about money or money management when you were young? I think the first thing that people need to appreciate about money management is make time for your money. Mm. So one of the secrets is that we spend so much time earning money. We spend so much time doing different things with yes. money, but we have never sat and tried to have a relationship with your money. So what do you mean by that? I'm not saying you must sleep in your bed with your money and thing, but the, the, <laughs> the, the, the point is everybody who's listening here tonight mm -hmm. can become materially more wealthy if they, if they just took as simple as an hour every month to just discuss their money. So what do I mean by that? Right. You spend an hour each month looking at where your money is. You're looking at what you want to spend your money on. You're looking at what you want to return from your money and the different projections that you want to do. What you find is that when you start to make space to have a discussion about your money, it starts to, it starts to give you a better return. Yeah. Because, again, one of the things in my experience that I've seen is that the people who don't spend time with their money are the ones that lose the most. Hmm. So just simply moving your money from a particular instrument I mean, I can give you an example. You're moving your money from a savings account in a commercial bank to the security dealer that is a subsidiary of that commercial bank can increase your returns in some instances by 100%. You move from even half of 1% to 2%. Right. You know, um, just simply calling around at maturity, you'll get a better return. And that's just a simple phone call. So, so it is all about having a relationship and having a, an intentional relationship. Yes. Not just about budgeting and figuring out how much money you have and yes. how much you need to spend as an expense. Correct. But how your money yes. that you are bringing in can help. Yes. And can continue to help you. Because, again, the problem is that most people just focus on earning the money. So after you earn the money, you drop it into a bank account. And then you, and you don't spend it lick -a -lick -a. And you don't realize that that money really is there to be earned. So you, 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 you hear people use different words about passive income, et cetera. The money can work for you. you know, so if you, have, if you have good investments, regardless of what you're earning as an employee, mm -hmm. that, those investments will throw off enough to, to, for you to deal with the, the things you want to do in life. You know? But over time, as you amass your wealth, 
you're going to have different choices. So you're right. going to have monies in different places, etc. So you have to make that time Boy, to Gary. maximize each time. Gary, come into the digital masterclass and mash a holy pecan. Not yet. You mash, not yet, my goodness. All right, so let me ask you this. What, based on your experience and yes. based on what you have seen, right. what is the biggest misconception Jamaicans have when it comes to money management and even about wealth? What's the biggest misconceptions you see? That it's simple. Hmm. Because it's hard work. So in most developed countries, one of the key persons that they have is their financial advisor. Yes. Their financial advisor would come ahead of the lawyer, the doctor, the nurse. In Jamaica, it's different because everybody believes they're a financial <laughs> advisor. <laughs> I'm an expert, right? <laughs> you know, so you, I, I've seen so many instances where people tell me, you know, they can do my job. I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, wow. um, we spend ridiculous amount of hours understanding businesses, understanding market trends, etc. And then somebody just pops up and say, oh, that's not a big deal. So again, I, and, and I find that a lot of those people are the ones that people listen to mm -hmm. from time to time, right? Yeah. So people pick up a lot of bad, bad practices, etc. And, and, as, and you, as you speak about bad practices, um, you know, being in the position you're in, what are some of the things that we, uh, as, as consumers, as persons who are interested in, 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 in investing, when people pop up, how are we able to identify, okay, does this person seem to make sense or is this person just positioning well? Like, are there... Telltale signs, are there red yeah. flags that we can look out for? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very difficult to find a very good financial advisor. And, yeah. you know, the, the, the business of financial advising, one of the problems with it is that, I mean, obviously, it's time-bound, and you're only mm -hmm. 24 hours in the day. And as your portfolio grows, you, you tend to spend more time around the person that gives you the biggest return. But notwithstanding that, I mean, even a simple conversation, you can ask certain questions and we give different tips, etc. But... I come back to my first recommendation. Have a relationship with your money. Right. So that you know that every month, whether it is a Sunday at 1 p.m., you're going to sit down, you're going to pull out all the statements, you're going to pull out everything associated with your money, and you're going to go through that. And then up to that point, you're going to think about all the things that have happened during the period. You know, I got a dividend check, so it's more than what I expected. Right. I had an emergency in terms of this and that. You know, and... Issues like taxes. So, for example, the culture of Jamaica, especially for a medium and lower earning sub person, you know, is not that taxes don't get into the conversation. Never. But especially where Jamaica is going as we move forward in a more fiscally prudent way, um, there, there's a requirement for you to be filing your taxes on, on an annual basis, which again requires you to, to have, have a relationship with, with your, your money. money. Right? Yeah, it comes back to it. Correct, because that's what happens in developed worlds. You know, so as we grow up as a country and as our people grow up with the country, we're going to have to take on these habits. Mm -hmm. And money is not something, as I said, coming back to the point about it seemingly easy, you have some people who are expert at begging other people money. You know, you mm -hmm. have that friend that every time <laughs> you get money, they just happen to have a story for you to lend them that money, <laughs> right? So... <laughs> you need to have, I don't you're not saying anything. No, that's not like you have that friend. I don't right? have that friend, right. Gary. Right. I don't, right. don't know what you're no, talking no, no. about. Only me have it, right? Only me have it, right? <laughs> but you have the same way that you don't have a relationship with your money. There are people out there watching when you, when you come into money, right? Yeah. And it takes time. And I'm, it, it, I've, I've done it as, in a funny way, but it is real. Because what you find is that the people who don't have that relationship with their money and they're leaving the money in their savings account, there is somebody else that's realizing, oh, you have all this money piled up there and you really don't know what Correct. to do with it. Correct. You know, my mother dropped down. Uh, I beg you I help here. Everybody is going to have an issue till your pile is done. And so it doesn't matter who, what, why, or where. There's always something to be done. So, for example, as I explained to some people, it depends on what your choices are in life. Right. So I've seen people, you know, when they retire at 50 or they get at 45, that region, where they start to take their foot off the gas. And they're fine. And you're like, aren't you worried about getting sick? They're like, no, I have bought insurance over a period of time. So when they were buying insurance and foregoing buying up an apartment or an additional apartment, they have decided that I want to make sure that when I'm older, my health bills right. will not erode my investment at that point. So it also time. comes. So it also uh, ties in or aligns to what you prioritize, what your goals, Correct. what your targets, what your objectives Correct. are. Which is the second secret I would say to you: you have to appreciate your position in life at different points in life. So one of the greatest challenges that I've seen with people, especially in Jamaica, they don't appreciate their current situation. Hmm. 
And there are a variety of reasons for it. I mean, you know, people pride, they're proud, them, this, etc. But if you earn a thousand dollars, you should Work not expend it. more than Work with it. a thousand dollars. Absolutely. You know, and in the Absolutely. same way, and what people miss, if you adopt a philosophy of spending less than you earn, you will not have a financial problem. Right? Why do you think that is so difficult for persons to grasp? The fact that, you know, if you continue to put your hat where your hand can't reach it, it just it cannot be sustainable. It, it, it cannot be viable. Yes and no. Yes and no. Yes Expound. And no. So I'll give you an example. You know, there are different things which are allowable. Mm -hmm. So I would argue that you could overinvest in your primary house. So if you see a property that you want, and it's going to be your first property, and you can comfortably spend $5 million on it as a number. Right. Um, but you see it's desirable. You know your, your career is growing. You expect to get a salary increase each year for the next two, three years. You might say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stretch and spend and, 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 and buy it for $7 million. Hey. Because it's your primary residence. Mm -hmm. you, you're not, it, it is now eliminating your rental. You expect your salary to start to grow. And as the salary grows, that initial mortgage will fall. Correct. Right? But something like that is what I would advise somebody to stretch and do. But for somebody now to stretch and buy a wicked red dress. <laughs> <laughs> I just want you guys to know that this red dress does not cost $5 million. You hear from set up with the side out of the side of your eye and the side of your mouth. No, but let me tell you, you know, I, I, you know, I was thinking about this the whole day, right? I don't have to create no problems, right? But one of the most efficient financial destructors mm -hmm. of value mm -hmm. is clothes. Yes. Absolutely. Because if you think about it, right? We have a little hot girl like you, though, right? And you go buy her. You, you, you find out the truth work, where I work the story. Money management. Says right, life. Right, says right, life. Right, says right, life. Right. Says I'm, life. I'm, I'm, I'm an okay right. so woman. So when I have a little ugly girl like you, since you feel more comfortable. All right. Like, I can work with that. And you buy, and it's a very serious thing, mm -hmm. and it's something that a lot of people don't understand. When you go and you're trying to make an impression, which is fine, and you buy that dress, and the more the dress makes that impression, is the greater the probability you can wear it again for at least another 10 years. No, you see, that's where you and I disagree. You know? Okay. Although I do understand in the Jamaican culture, which is very, uh, you know, it's very proud. That's exactly what a person said. I cannot repeat my clothes. However... So you you wear a hot, a hot well, dress yesterday. Well, let me explain today. something. And if okay. anybody who is a member of my Insta family might be, you know, watching us live, they can attest to it that I am someone in the space who speaks about repeating your clothes. It's me by it. It's, it's mine. It's my property. So you have just demonstrated. And I'm going to wear it because I paid for it. Yeah, but what you've just demonstrated. And I shall not be proud. But what you've just demonstrated is that you're in a minority because you accept your situation. You have a lot of other people that the society forces on them that you can't repeat. And they're trying not to repeat. So and continue then they to make bust, an impression. Continue they bust to spend money. Whatever their potential income is. So that's one of the that's his factor life. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not a problem if somebody says, hey, let's go to this party and say, hey, I, I, I can't go. I don't know clothes. I agree. And it, 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 I mean, there's nothing wrong if you miss one party. I agree. Right? But a lot of other people don't have that view. Right. You know, and as I said, you, people don't appreciate. And again, why I said such an efficient destructor? You, you, you build a wardrobe over time. And, you know, you have dresses that start from 1,000 Jamaican all the way to 10 million Jamaican, depending on the type of brands you have, right? So if you're in that category and you don't have an income that is falling, that's allowing you to do that, you're going to have your challenge, right? Absolutely. And remember, whether the dress costs a million dollars or a thousand dollars, the termite, the moth, the rat, see the same way. They're going to eat it the same way. Absolutely. Right? So again, I'm not saying you should not buy clothes. Or that you can't treat yourself. Or you can't I mean, treat yourself. You're not saying that, right. but certainly you're saying don't do that over a uh, Correct. It has uh, to be done in a responsible way. Because people don't understand the cost of certain habits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, if you smoke and you calculate over a period of 10, 20 years, because, you know, you might, if you think about it as $700 a pack today and seven, it doesn't seem a lot. But when you extend it for 10 years. And you add it up. You add it up. You could actually put your child through school. Absolutely. And then he, another one that, that can be a little risque. All right, I'll take your third. Your, your children. The last time I said this, somebody was like, Jesus Christ, Gary, you really said this. A child, the decision to make a child or to have a child is fundamentally, at today's price is a 20 to $30 million decision. <sighs> so when you think about a child, like, hey, I'm going to have a child and all this, et cetera, it is a commitment that you're making 
for the next 10 years, whether you have that 20 it's or 30 million dollars. Absolutely. Yeah, but people take it on not realizing that this is what it's about. So it's a great thing you have the kid, wonderful, right? Um, but then you got to send it to school, you have, you have your health Did experiences. He send, send him or her, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. You know, I'm <laughs> trying to try to be, think whatever. <laughs> but then the, the point is, if when you run the numbers mm -hmm. and you look at a couple that meet, and that's also that's the fourth one I'm slipping in, right? When you find families where the mother and father met early, sat down, have planned, and have decided that this is when we're going to have our children yes. after we reach here in our in our in our um, relationship or not a relationship or, mm -hmm. in our um, work mm -hmm. work progress, right? You find they have much happier families because when the children come along. You know, they, they have all that, they that, that, that's required, as opposed to some people who don't have the planned pregnancies or the planned ch children, and you end up now, monies that you would be using in a different way to invest. Have to be diverted. It's they have diverted, to be diverted elsewhere. And it becomes a whole different ball of white. Just a whole bunch of unhappiness. All but right. No, no, I hear you. No, proper man, money management you. would No, man, that. I hear you. And I mean, although it is a, it's a delicate topic, it's just a reality and it's something that yes. we have to speak about. So can you share how you think um, Jamaica or even Jamaican businesses will fare financially through the current challenges um, by, by COVID-19? It is, it is some of the similar challenges in the se se similar solutions in the sense that in COVID, what has happened is that you basically have three scenarios happening. Mm -hmm. You have some businesses, primarily in food-related businesses, that have just, for a better word, been good. They're making super profits because you're at home, you have to eat more, etc. cetera. And, and they've done very, very well. You have on the flip side, if you are in tourism or related to tourism, you're, you're just literally just hoping for the best. And then you have the middle of the pack. You know, so what has happened is that COVID has changed how a lot of things the have occurred. The landscape, absolutely. And so one of the key things that has occurred is the whole issue of work from home. You know, so there are so many people that are working from home and it does not change behavior. <laughs> so again, we had a conversation yesterday on the Mayberry Forum. You have a company like Mailpack where they're now making super profits because you can now stay at home, you're going to shop more online, and when you buy the thing, you know, ship it in, it comes to your door. And we're it's paying perfect. for delivery too. We're paying for, we're paying for yeah. everything. We Correct. do not want to leave. Correct. So if, as a business, you know, if you're looking to start a business, you're not looking and saying, okay, this is where I want to be. If you're an existing business, you obviously are going to have to decide how do you pivot, you know, to try and deal with that. So I have clients who were in the tourism industry. I mean, they've been decimated, but they've found new ways in which to get to the consumer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the, that's the second thing I would say to people in businesses now. COVID will pass. And I think we're at a point where we need to decide how much longer COVID will be here and then how do we plan to move forward once COVID passes. Correct. You know, I want to say COVID passes, it's not necessarily that we won't have COVID, but there'll be a full understanding of what COVID is about. And then we what have the new behavior is, the new, what the new correct. expectations are. We can come are. out of our caves more, etc. You and I can have an interview where you can take off your mask, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So, but that's what you have to look on. And then, but fundamentally, from COVID has come, there's one mantra that I've always said, I'm coming back to the relationship. It's cash. Yes. You have to have cash, you know. And so anything you're doing in your business right now, you want to focus on the items that will generate a lot of cash for you. And uh, Richard Pandui, he was our first uh, yes. guest, and he, he and he said he said the very same thing, you know. And 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 it, that was also a reason why so many uh, businesses were decimated because yeah, they were in business and yes, they were churning over, but when it came to the cash, yes, there was just no cash flow, and that is where a lot of them found themselves yeah. in, in problems. But again, you know, the, the thing about it is that, and I have found Jamaicans and Jamaica. Mm -hmm are excellent crisis managers. I find so right? as well. So if you're ever to be in a war or to be in a sufferation, have a Jamaican. We've, you will get you out of it, right? But the challenge now, not just for us as individuals, but as a country, is Jamaica has never, and Jamaica, a lot of Jamaican businessmen have never done well after you've come out of the crisis to build on it yes. and to keep building so you'll never have another crisis. Right. So, you know. So we get through it, we get complacent, and then we go, oof. Yeah, man, we're All done. All right, we're done with that. And Let's so we wait for the next one. Correct, correct, correct. You know, and I, I think that's another thing I would say to small businesses today is that if you survive COVID, you need to use that learning 
to just continue to build as opposed to sit and wait and talk about how well you did or well I got over it, etc. Right. You know, because business waits on no man. No business has a right to be in existence. I mean, we've seen some of the biggest businesses in the world, Lehman, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, that mm -hmm. just blow up overnight. True. You know, so what's so special about your business that it shouldn't blow up? You know, so the cash and then also, you know, visioning for the future because and there are a lot... An, and keeping an eye, I'm sure, being people-centric, being customer-centric and keeping an eye Correct. on the patterns Correct. and the Because there are, new, there are new opportunities um, developing. And, I mean, I've seen especially a lot of youngsters you know, with a lot of great ideas and finding different ways in which to do things. And I mean, it just, it just makes you happy that you're around such brilliant people that will find a way forward. Absolutely. Now, for the small businesses, we've always heard small businesses um, and small business owners, you know, complain about credit. You know, yes. they might have an issue getting the credit, finding the credit. You know, what advice do you have for, the, uh, for those owners who may have a very hard time getting credit in terms of weathering this storm? The greatest thing in business is, cre well, after cash, is mm -hmm. credit. And the worst thing in business is credit. credit. <laughs> Expound. <laughs> because we do have persons who are watching, who are on different si you know, signs of the, yeah. uh, of the spectrum. So and, what do you mean? You know, again, it, you, know, you, you need experts for these kind of things. So, you know, I'll give you a personal story, you know, when I'm suffering through life and thing, right? And so I'll give you another secret. <laughs> I, I do suffer in life. I didn't just born we got fun like this, right? But a credit card, one of, the most, one, of, one of the most beneficial things about a credit card is that you do not pay interest if you pay off the balance. So it can be one of the most powerful tools, especially when you need something, whether personal or for your business, that you don't have the resources normally now. And you can access right now. Because you can access right now. But you need to have the discipline that whatever you buy, you have already identified how you're going to repay it. So that's a positive and negative of a credit card mm -hmm. in that most people fall to the impulse of buying, but did not stop to think about how the hell are you going to repay it? So then now, I tell you about the beautiful thing about a credit card is when you pay off the balance, you don't pay interest. Yes. But when you don't pay that balance, it's dog, now you supper. Yeah. Right? It's because hit you. the interest is going to roll and roll and roll. You. So, what experts do, which I was an expert then, the biggest loophole in credit cards, right? I don't know if I should do this, but... You totally <laughs> should do this. This is why this is a master class, right, right, right. Gary. So, so, the loophole in credit cards is cash. <laughs> so, that's why when you have a credit card, if you, are, if you take a cash advance in your credit card, the financial institution charges you 5 or 6%. Because you can, you literally, if you could get cash, <laughs> you could use that cash, pay off the balance... Don't pay the interest, and then you continue paying. You're doing the same thing every month, right? So that's why if you take cash off the, the credit card, they charge you 5%. Oh. Well, how you get around it is... This is where everybody's, <laughs> like, everybody's like, come, Gary, we're waiting. You know, everybody's writing so, their notes. So, no, seriously. So how you get around it, right? You need to get two different credit cards with two different settlement dates or payment dates. So you get a credit card with a payment date at the start of the month, and you get one in the middle of the month. Right? So what you do now, you don't have to become very social. You got to socialize now. Right? Work with me on this. Because you buy what you want. Yes. You can't pay it back yet because you don't get back the money yet. So then what you do now, you say put that on one credit card. But then what you do now, the second credit card, you go out with your friends, and then when the bill is to be paid, you offer to pay the bill. So then everybody give you the cash, <laughs> and then you pay the bill. <laughs> and then you take the cash, and you pay on the first on the one. Card? And then we do that until you pay it up. In a real life? It happened. I saw so I went through my... Suffering. Your, your period of suffering. My period of suffering. I never thought about it because but we do have persons who have... And we do have persons yeah. who have multiple credit cards that have the very yes. same um, yes. date. So you're They're horror stories. They're horror stories ah. because, again, it comes back to some of the stuff I've said to you. You don't have a relationship with money. You have not taken the time to understand money. Your parents never told you about it. You have marketers that are saying to you, come and get this credit card, come and get this credit card, mm -hmm. right? It's poison if you don't know how. Just like anything in life, if you are not taught how to do something and, you're not and you decide to take it up. I mean, you take a knife and put it in a baby's hand and show him a, a socket, it's not going to end well. You know what's going to happen, yeah, right? for sure. And so like anything else, I've found that it is so strange because a lot of people are interested in their money, mm -hmm. but the majority of people 
refuse to learn about their money. Wow. Well, um, that, that's a, I think a lot of persons are going to go away saying, mind blown, never in your body. And sometimes they're just so simple. My next question to you is, what's your best advice to small, medium, or even large firms having to find the capital to conduct digital transformation due to COVID-19. So we, we've, we, we heard from Aileen Corrigan um, last week. She was yes. speaking about digital transformation. Yes. And we were saying that sometimes it's not about getting the most expensive or the largest software or hardware, but sometimes it requires you putting in, changing out your systems, your processes, yes. or creating new ways to, to reach or serve your, your customers and clients. Yes. So what advice do you have for small and medium large that might be having you know, to find to th th this, this capital? for their digital transformation? So the first thing I'll say to you is don't worry. Um, the second thing I'll say to you is even when this whole digital discussion comes to a conclusion where you have digitized everything, right. there still will be cash. Because it's, everybody's talking about digitization, it's important, yeah? I'm doing it in the different businesses that we have. In and of itself, it's not the end all. Not the end all be all. It's supposed to make a lot of things easier, but you still are going to have to conduct business. So at Maybury, we have one of the best apps. So I can put you on my app. You're going to see the balance on your account, but you still want financial advice as to what to do with the money you've just lodged. So it's not the end all if you haven't digitized. Secondly, one of the things you found, and when you look at the developed world, they're, they're creating what is called, for a better word, a subscription service, a subscription life, yeah. in the sense that in the past, you would have to buy a specific software to do certain things. You can now pay as you go, for a better word. So if you're setting up a small business... And different you, kind of bundles as well. Yeah, you can go online and you can get Microsoft QuickBooks for a period of time for a very small subscription amount. And I think that is going to be one of the key things um, going forward. Now, in terms of the capital, again, what I spoke about before, you have to make a decision because in every business, there is a, I, I refer to it as a hierarchy of value. Mm -hmm. I try to spend the most money in the area that gives me the biggest return. And that makes sense. And that's where you should go. You know, so at the end of the day, whilst everybody, there are certain businesses that need to digitize and you need to have that investment. So again, my business in Maybury, digitization makes more sense, especially in this, in, at, at this time, because it's just a telephone call for us. Right. But at SVL, one of the biggest benefits, one of the biggest value creators in SVL is our agent network, because they still move a significant amount of cash. And it doesn't matter how much you digitize, mm -hmm. right? You know, follow me through on this one. You know, I've dropped a little joke in it, right? I don't know if you've had one of those grandmothers that when you're young, growing up, you go and she go in her breast and she take out. <laughs> yes, little, all of us. Right, I, think all, I think that's a Caribbean right? thing or a black, right? black yeah, well, one she, thing. She take out a little twenty dollar, hundred dollar, and best bank ever. I, and you have the biggest smile. You go buy a ticket, <laughs> right? Right. So for, hear me now. You go to her now, and she go take out her cell phone. I say, my child, type in the pin right, and so I just take out hundred dollar. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. That, that's just my view, right? Yeah. Um, so we've seen where. You know, the, 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 the digital payments work very well in Kenya, in Pesa, et cetera. But in a lot of other regions, especially in South America, cash, cash, is, still cash is still king. a huge thing. Cash right? is still king. So, again, I've kind of answered in a roundabout way. I'm saying, hey, don't kill yourself if you can't find the capital. Um, but in terms of finding the capital, you have places like Development Bank of Jamaica um, that, that has different programs. Um, today, we're in a discussion. There's something that's called reverse factoring where you can get your payables discounted and okay. you can get your cash earlier, the supplier can get it earlier. So there are a lot of these things that are there. So it sounds as if it also takes some amount of um, um, research. Search, research. But again, I'm coming back to a relationship with your money. money. So we started <laughs> on an individual basis, but I think where you're kind of moving into is mm -hmm. now with a business. So if you're talking about your own money, you're spending an hour. If you have a business, you need to have at least three or four hours every month where you're going to sit down and think about your business and say, okay, fine, how can I do this? What am I doing wrong? Where's where am I, where's sucking me dry? Where can I divert and, the funds? X, and y, that's where having good advisors around you makes sense. So like what I've just explained to you is something that the DBJ is coming out with that would be amazing for a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises that to know that your payables, can, we can find a way in which to, 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 to finance your payables. Absolutely. You know? So again, 
when you are in the, the throes of your business, yeah, you're not, you don't have the time to go to that conference where it was told that you have reverse factoring. And if you don't have a structure set up, you know, that those people are going to come and say, you know, when you're having that two or three hour period where you're sitting and thinking about your business, it should also be with your advisors. Hmm. Where, and, and again, I don't want to go too far on it, but if you think individuals have a problem telling the kids about money, when you talk about it, a Jamaican business owner, them no one say nothing to nobody. Yeah, yeah. But in developed countries, business owners have different places they can go where they can show and discuss problems and get solutions in how to fix it. Right, but let me ask you a question because I know that there are some persons who might be asking right now, you know, they're hearing about reverse factoring. Uh, right. So they're just like, okay, so sounds good. Uh, what, what is it? If you can break it down in terms of the, the, the term. Well, what most people think about when they think of factoring is factoring receivables. So receivables, as the name indicate, is that you have made a sale, you made a sale on credit, and the person you have sold to is supposed to pay you at a particular period in time. Mm -hmm. You might have an agreed period, of, a credit period of, say, 30 days. Right. And then, so on your books, that is recorded as a receivable until you pay. Mm -hmm. In the 30-day period, if the business has a need and wants cash, they can approach a financial intermediary and say, hey, listen, I have... I sold Terry this dress for $5 million. The red dress, <laughs> red dress again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the red dress again. <laughs> sold it a dress for $5 million. Terry, go and pay me in 30 days, right? So, and I have it here to show you. Mm -hmm. Give me $4 million. And give me $4 million now. And in 30 days, Terry will pay you directly $5 million. The reason I would do it is that I will make a million dollars over the period. I make a 20... So I see basically you would have sold me a 20% discount. It's a win-win. I get the, the, the it's 4 million to, that I want, right, seemingly, as a and, business, you, and right. you get your I get my million, Correct. you have your address, everybody's fine. <laughs> so that's the factoring. Reverse factoring now is payables, financing payables. So what payables is now is that the person that you bought the dress from bought the dress from some guy in Italy. <laughs> So he paid $3 million for the dress. So he owes that guy $3 million. And that guy wants to be paid. So, and he's honing the person for the money. So an intermediary can now come, pay the guy for a discount, and everybody is happy. So your intermediary makes his spread. The guy gets some money earlier. The Don't business is not you. suffering. The customer, every, again, Correct. it's a, okay. Correct. And again, but again, it's all dependent on all the people honoring their sides of it, which we hope is Absolutely. the case. Absolutely. But it's very innovative ways of finding financing. And especially for medium and small business, it's important because they don't have a lot of what we call traditional security. Yes. But they do have a lot of receivables. They have a lot of payables. And it's, it's really a way, if it is done properly, you go down the road. That's very interesting. Thank right. you for that. I mean, I'm literally, I mean, and of course, for those of you who might be watching, whether it's the webinar jam right. or across social media, let us know what you're thinking because so, we're definitely sorry, learning if I a may. lot of So the, the person who's handling it at DBJ is Paul Chin. Paul, and he just threw out her name. So there you go. Just Call write him. it down. And again, if you, if uh, we are going to invite you to submit your questions, just make sure that you use the hashtag Digital Masterclass as well as the hashtag Digital Business, which is probably a good segue into my next questions. What? Uh, do yeah, oh gosh, I, I got, I got, I got paper, I got questions. Um, not so sure how active you are on social media, right. you know, I, I don't know. But right now we see a lot of persons using their Instagram stories and they're using features that allow you to swipe up and you can go straight to their website if they're an e-commerce business. But some companies, especially the small businesses, are using social media and these different features to assist them in terms of making it their first step in business. Are they going about the right way or do you have any recommendations? So again, I, I am back to my, my position is that, listen, there are horses for courses, not because we, <laughs> we mess with Cayman as at Supreme, <laughs> but the Lord made each of us differently. And, you know, some of us are brighter than the others and some people are blessed with knowing to do everything. And those are mainly Jamaicans that can do everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> So my, my answer to you is that you have people that have now created a job for themselves as a social media influencer. 
there are people, you know, like these guys at Mystique, et cetera, who have a track record in being able to manage your business and able to carry traffic and you boost and what drive. you need to boost mm -hmm. and stuff, right? And, you know, the reason I say horses for courses is that where you want to be in your business is that if everybody is doing what their, their greatest potential is, that's when you get the best out of a business. So if you're the business owner and your potential is to be the best salesperson, focus on sales in terms of peer-to-peer -peer sales, yeah? So social media is very important, but you can go and try and read a book to try and get to understand it, or once it's within your budget, you know, you find somebody, an expert, and get it done. Unfortunately, again, what I've seen is that everybody is an expert because you, anybody can order booze, anybody can, right? You know, and um, you always hear the story, I have a friend. Mm -hmm. And so what I would say is, you know, be careful about the friend that claim that they can do X and try and do some background checks to ensure that this person what can is the track really, record? Can what really is the deliver. What is proof? Yes. Absolutely. You know, and I think once you do that, you can position your, your business very, very well mm -hmm. in terms of how you can move forward. You know, so I can tell you at Mayberry, we have benefited significantly um, from social media. So I'll give you an example. We took a decision about three, four years ago that we were, were not going to advertise in traditional media. Mm. Um, that's print media. That's pretty progressive and, because a lot of companies and, are just catching on now. Well, the, the fact is that we just focused on social media. And um, we saw... Obviously, a significant saving, but we also saw an increase in our brand position That's and brand right. profile, etc. But it was done with experts like Mystique, Vala, etc. There was yeah, intention, you know, and that's the way to go about it. And as I said, I mean, we might be blessed to have the resources to do it in a particular way at Maybury, and that's another thing that people need to understand: the fact that you don't have the necessary resources don't mean you can't strive towards doing something well. Oh, for sure. Yeah? So you will have people who, that friend mm -hmm. actually could have a talent. And if you find the right friend and they're able to do it and they'll probably do it at a subsidized rate, then fine, you go there. But you must always have a vision for your business. There must come a point in your business where you can draw that check. Oh, yeah. Right? Because your business must start to grow at some point in time. Before you used to, I mean, uh, there's stories. I mean, I won't call the guy's name, but there's a particular guy that when he started a particular business, they didn't sell in the quantities that he wanted because it was so small. They had to drain gallons of drum into like a quart bottle, right? And that guy started from there and now has one of the biggest businesses and is now right. when he started to buy from that company, he would get the drain out of, out of the 50-gallon the drums right. into a quarter thing, right? You'd get the drain. And he is now their single largest customer. There you go. You know, so it, it, you must always have a vision as to where it's, where it's going to get. And as you get the resources, you try and bring in more and more experts. Fantastic. What are the most common financial mistakes you see uh, Jamaican businesses making? And how can someone... I mean, you alluded to some, but are there any more uh, mistakes that you, that you can probably say... I, I noticed this and I noticed this that we, we really need to, to, to fix. The biggest mistake, obviously, is capital, not having enough capital. And, it's, and, and to be fair, it, it's always easy for a professional like myself to look in your business and say you don't have enough capital. Um, because I do know it's, 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 it's very challenging for people to get capital, especially equity capital. Yes. And we've moved significantly with the junior market. There are more people able to do it. But I have found that one of the reasons it's difficult is that the holders of equity sometimes drives a ridiculous bargain to, mm -hmm. to, to, to give up equity, you know? And so somewhere in there, if you don't negotiate it properly, what suffers is the business. The second thing is that Jamaica tends to have a lot of forced entrepreneurs. So you have people who innately want to start a business, but you have some people who start a business because they just get fired. And then they have not listened. Them just decide they, they have first, to do something. They have to they do, have to do something. something. You understand? And so you're doing it, you've actually come up on a good idea, you're actually running a good business, but you need to take out a million dollars to pay for the kid, the, the family, the this, the that. And the business is always starved for capital. You know, so you, you, you see it voluntarily and involuntarily. The other key thing that we've found is um, 
It's your compensation. So you have a lot of business owners, especially small business owners, who feel that the, the cheaper they can pay you is the more beneficial their business is going to be. Yes, sir. Right? And I understand. I can just hear people in social media right. and saying, preach, Gary, preach. I don't, I don't want to be preaching. But <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not that. And don't get me wrong. I mean, every business can afford to do certain things and there's a limit. But you do have some businesses that buy, you know, if they really could get you to work for free for the rest they of would. your life, they, they would. would. Um, and I think that's something because over time, you actually will have some employees who are really salt of the earth that because of that mindset, they leave you and the cost, the, the, the business will suffer because of that. So talent management is... And is, talent retention. And talent, and talent which recruitment. Which comes down to management, uh -huh. right, is, is, is very key. And because, you know, an entrepreneur is a special breed. And one of the challenges I've found in Jamaica is that when they find an idea, they hold on to the idea, not realizing their expertise is getting ideas. Yeah. So what should happen is that I have an idea to open a dress, a dress store. When I open it, I should really call Terry and say, Terry, run this for me, hire the people, because I have another idea to open a camera store. Right. No. And get the right people. And get the right people. No, you go in, you run it, then you, walk, you become the bush accountant, the bush lawyer, the bush operations. You're trying to do each Everything. of the different things. And the, 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 and yet the stories are all the same. You know, they, they didn't have time to wait on this one, that one, etc. You know, but the business suffers. You know, a couple of them are really good at making it through. Yeah. So, I mean, you talk like um, the Glens of this world, Karimed. I mean, he's just a, a, an amazing story, you know, in how he has been able to do what he has done. Right. But he's, 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 a, he's a dime, not even a dime a dozen. He's a dime 12 million yeah. dozens, right? Yeah. Not everybody's going to go down that road and you're going to end up with, 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 with that outcome. Okay. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in, 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 in some of the mistakes that you were mentioning, you know, some people who might get fired or they were laid off and right. just didn't go do a thing. Um, yes, COVID-19 is here. Yes, the pandemic is here. Yes, a lot of persons have been affected. Yeah. Do you think it's a good time to actually start a business? And if those persons might be watching right now who are sitting down saying, you know, I need to start a business. I want to be an entrepreneur and I'm going to take advantage of this period. What are the considerations they should have? So I'll start by saying it's always a good time to start a business. But there is a reason we have a six and a half billion people on this planet. I don't think entrepreneurs represents as much as 0 0.01. Hmm. You know, formulating a business is tough. There are very few people that can do it. Running a business is even tougher. Starting a business, running a business, it's, it's, it's really, really hard, right? And so you've always heard the story, I've gotten laid off and I started a business. You've gotten laid off, you can get another job. Right, because you, know, you just want to get back into something that pays you. Right. right? Um, ultimate dream is to have your business and you earn and you go down the road. But what is likely is if you lose your job, one of the things you should really look at is look into the workspace to say where's the best place to re-enter, and how do you position yourself for that? You know. So when I was growing up and fooling myself and thinking of this, et cetera, you, you got to that point, you dropped way off of the thing. Right. And when you sat down and you realized what the damage was, you realized your choices were you could do stuff that you literally could lose your life because you're trying to find a quick way back. Correct. Or you just, ac remember I started, accept where you are. Accept your situation, right? So once you accept your situation, you come to the next best thing, which you're going to now plan, how do you move forward, Right. And so when I looked on it, the, the limiting factor was a degree. You know, we could, but I could never sit down long enough to get a degree, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing with dominoes. So after fooling yourself and you realize the damage and you're going to have to do this thing, right? You just have to accept, okay, this is a plan, and then you execute a plan to the best of your knowledge within the limits of the cash that you have. And you will find that sometimes when you do these plans, Plans are three years, four years, five years, and it seems like so far away. You know, I, I remember, I, I go off a bit, I remember, you know, because I dropped out of university, right? Mm -hmm. And every time I was to go back, I'd feel shame because old boy, I go back to school. Uh, so. You were the youngins. The youngins and all nine yards. When I finally decide to go back to Rati, 27 year old, when I walk in, the man who sit down beside me at 58. <laughs> I felt so stupid. I was like, really? <laughs> 58. I'm good, Bridget, love him to death, right? But 
the same point I'm making. Yeah. He was saying he had just gotten laid off at 50 odd and he wow. couldn't get a particular job because he never had a degree and he decided that before he died he was going to get a degree. Wow. Right? And at the time, so, we went, so I went back, got over the thing about being too old to be in university. And basically, between, between the master, between the first degree and the master's, I just shut it off, it just shut off in five years. And I remember when it started, I'm like, Jesus Christ, really? Five too years, far. too far, far too far, mm -hmm. too far, right? And when it was finished, everything changed. I mean, that's when I started putting out some serious food. I, I used to only eat tin food, you know. <laughs> he said I gave him the first promotion. <laughs> oh, my girl. I don't stop eating out every day. I think to this day, I still eat it out. I can't get over it, right? <laughs> but, but, but this is what it does. Yeah. When you plan something and you really you seriously plan, you focus, you focus, stick to it, you stick get to it, it done. you get it done, and you, start, you go through some suffering, you know, right? Because understand, you're trying not to spend more than you earn, right? So you're going to school, you're working at the same time, it's difficult, you have a car payment, you have this, etc. It's tough. Right? But you just have to keep in the back of the mind. This are the plan. Mm -hmm. And if you execute the plan, food. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you're just like food. So listen, we just spoke. Oh my goodness. I can just imagine the comments. Listen. So we, 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 the question that we just asked a while ago was, yeah. you know, is this a right time to start? And for those persons who want to jump in it, you know, that's great. Right. We're going to flip the, the other side. Or we're going to flip the coin. And we're going to say, well, as a business owner, yes. when is it the right time? to lock shop and start again. Because sometimes what happens is that they have a business and they don't know. And I think it was also Nasha, Monique, who spoke about it in brand building. When they have a product or they have a business and it's, it's, they beat the dead horse, they beat the dead horse and they hold on to it till there's no coming back, no rebranding, no nothing. When is it or when should our entrepreneurs know when to lock shop? And to start again, whether to start over the same brand or to start something completely new? Gary's like, oh my gosh. No, let me, let me tell you something. I mean, um, that one, no, you have to take all the fun and joke aside. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's serious things. Um, and you, you never, ever want to see that. Mm -hmm. But that is such a major question. And the problem is that it's very dangerous. It's actually very dangerous in Jamaica. And how the laws, well, until recently, were set up. You are basically... It, is, it was structured in a way where usually by the, it, 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 is, it is when you don't have any more money that mm -hmm. it just collapses on itself. That's it. So, you know, it's something that, I mean, I've spent a lot of time, you know, discussing with some of the authorities. And thankfully, I think two years ago, you know, Jamaica now has an insolvency act where you can declare bankruptcy and your creditors, you stall your creditors, et cetera. And oh, really? that structure is in place in a lot of developed countries like the United States, Chapter 11, Chapter days, et cetera. So, You're right, because I've always heard it from the developed countries, but I, I didn't even correct. know that was a, a consideration so, here. So we, 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 it was put into effect, I think, two, three years ago, if memory serves me correct. And I think what that has done, thankfully, is that it now creates an environment that, because you see the question you asked, mm -hmm. um, you know, at Maybury, we've listed a lot of companies, probably more companies than most companies, uh, most, most of my competitors. But there is no child, wife, mother, sister mm -hmm. that is closer to a business owner than a business. It is the most amazing thing. They put them guts, them stretch, them tears, them, and I just love it. It is, it is this inanimate object, but when you hear them talk about it, passion. you would have, you, know, you think it's something, purpose. right? So, you know, it's, it's literally, they're, they're, they're thinking it. The equivalent is like, you know, some, some, one of their own is dying. And one of the challenges with, with determining that you must give up a business is there's an inflection point in a business where you hear a lot of people give the stories. And the stories you hear mm -hmm. is that, you know, I couldn't find a payroll. I couldn't find a payroll a Friday, but... I don't like a juggling on a fine next Friday, this, and then we make it from there and we're good to go. That's in the minority. In the majority of instances, what happens is that you don't find a payroll, yeah. you don't find it the following week, the monies keep getting less and less. Right. Then people start to get angry, you know, and it gets, it's get, it gets very messy. And, you know, to, 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 to answer your question, I mean, I find it comes back to the values of the entrepreneur. 
And in the sense that you have some entrepreneurs that say, listen, I do not want anybody to say that I owe them any money. Mm -hmm. So when they run the numbers and they realize that the business is not at a point where you're going to start to own people, they will then say, that's enough. Oh, nice. And they'll negotiate with people and call it a day. Um, you know, and, but for most people, it literally is when the last dollar has been sucked dry out of the thing and the people come for bond on the place. You're like, all right. And that's it. I will, I will try and do it. And that's it. But again, it's cultural in the sense that, again, unfortunately, Jamaica and Jamaicans are very, very hard on losers, especially yeah. business losers. But hold on, but hold on. Don't, don't stick a, stick a, stick a pin, stick a holy pop pin. Guys, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. We know you have your questions and Gary has to, Gary has to finish at least one more question. We'll be right back. Welcome back, guys. Thank you so very much for sticking and staying with us. This is a very saucy co you know, conversation, Digital Masterclass series. This is the Money Moves edition, and we could not have asked for a better master than Gary Peer, CEO of Mayberry Investments. And you were saying that Jamaicans are, are hard on... Yeah, Jamaicans are very hard on losers. I mean, in any sphere of life. I mean, if, if you know, the West Indies not winning, oh, Jesus, you know, <laughs> you know. We lost to Saudi Arabia, but gee, oh, them don't work nothing the following day, 2 1. Hey, that's my side. Yeah, you know, yeah, for sure. Around and we do, uh, for sure. In business, it's 10 times worse. Mm. And if you blow up a business, I mean, you're almost like persona non grata. And again, it's because this, the, the, the environment is not similar to what is happening in the developed world. So you actually have people in the developed world who say, hey, you know, I've been bankrupt four or five times, you know, Trump. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you have other people that, that you know, speak to it because how, how they're structured. So, for example, when you, if you blow up a business, mm -hmm. there are certain tax benefits you'll get as an investor right. you know, because the business has blown up. It's not the case here. Um, and, but the good thing is that the structure is, is now being put in place. That's fantastic. That. That's fantastic. Yeah. And we hope that it can certainly yeah. um, help those businesses. Um, I, I literally saw you move from you know, laughing to understanding that this question and yeah. this reality is, is a massive That's, one. You don't want those conversations. Yeah, and, we, and I hope that the nugget that you just dropped, even with, um, with the consideration that, right. you, that you spoke about, that persons will do more research right. and find out if, of course, they're eligible in, in whatever way. My final question to you before I throw to my promise. social media peeps, okay. I promise, is um, can you give us some uh, investment advice? If someone has a little bit of money, I don't know if you know the song, Go away with a little bit of money. If somebody have a little bit of money right now to invest, what? Who should they invest in? Uh, maybe. <laughs> and you could say that. <laughs> but let me, let me say this to you. Um, you know, anybody mm -hmm. that's a most move with a little bit of money, mm -hmm. that's it. True. I cannot walk past a dollar coin. Impossible. If you leave that ground, I'll pay it up. Right? And, and simple mean. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't get no argument with anybody about, you know, a little bit of money. But I have a savings plan mm -hmm. that you get from your mother days and come all the way up. And I put those coins in there. The last time I broke it, it was $12,000 worth Oof. of coins. Right? So the point I'm making, nothing is too little. 
to invest? Right. The first, the first stock that I bought for my mother, well, she spent two thousand dollars, and when that stock was delisted, she got a check for eight hundred thousand dollars. Right. And at the time of that two thousand dollars, you know, anybody could have found it. You know, and even now, people don't appreciate the power. So let me give you an example of what people need to understand. Somebody will not put money into a bank because they're paying one percent interest. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're doing math now. So if you put $100 in the bank, your interest you earn is a dollar, a little bit. But dream with me now. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm staying with you. You put $100 billion in the bank. What is your interest? Good grief. Get past 100 billion. We talk about interest. Listen, I at, was at, just what, saying, at the same, at the same, at no, hold on, hold on. Listen. If you put 100 billion in the bank, at the same 1%, what's your interest? You tell me. It's a billion dollar. Mm -hmm. It's the same concept, whether it's a hundred dollars or a hundred billion dollars. So my question to you is that when I just, just simple things, eh? When I told when I use the example of the hundred dollars, you did not even move. But when I said a hundred billion, you couldn't get you didn't hear the rest of the conversation Listen, about a hundred billion. I turned right? my head because I said, whoa. But the point is. Mm -hmm. In the investing world, and when you start to understand the relationship with your money, the principle is the same. Mm -hmm. So whether you have a hundred billion or you have a hundred dollars, you should try to get a similar, if not greater, return, right? And that way, so for, if you if you accept that, mm -hmm. there's nothing that's too little, right? Because but 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 and and you do understand that the reason why the, the the terminology of even little bit of money is because whenever it comes to investment, there is a myth you know, that you have to have yes. a ridiculous amount of money. So for those persons who may not have the millions or may not have the hundreds of thousands but have a conservative amount of money, is there any particular thing that you think they should at least consider investing in now? No, obviously it's, it's, it's stock. And, you know, I, I want to I be very careful when I say this, right? And again, you know, the whole it's the concept of liquid money, you know, I mean, it's, it's a popular song and people think about that, right? But... What people miss, there's a, there's a concept of inflation in terms of how money grew over time, mm -hmm. right? So let's put this into perspective. Let's, let's, let's use that area. Um, Cherry Gardens. When the original owner of Cherry Gardens, a one-man owned the whole thing, decided to subdivide, I have a friend that bought one of the lots. Mm -hmm. And the lots were sold for, I think it was 12,000 Jamaican dollars for like a, a half an acre. Right? Give or take. 12,000 Jamaican dollars. In those times, during that time, it was in the 70s, $100 was a significant amount of money. Much less 12. When I went to high school, my lunch money for the week was a dollar. And I, had ex I could save from that. Right? So we're getting back to the concept of so called little bit of money because the, the nominal value changes over time mm -hmm. and obviously what you can buy. So what you want to do, which is why when you, hear to, when you, when you ask the question before, when do you start your business, the answer is no. When do you start to save, the answer is no. When you start to invest, the answer is no. The reason the answer is no is that the moment you start, you start to benefit from what is called in compound. Your return on your principal and it moves again. Yes, sir. So obviously, the quicker you start, is the, the bigger more the number is going to be down the road, right? Correct. So then you, you get into a position as to what are the things that can create that. So one of them, obviously, is stocks because you own a part of a business and it can grow. Obviously, there's some real estate. And, you know, depending on where you are, foreign exchange, Jamaican dollars, different currencies, etc. So it depends on where you are. Yes. Okay. Well, we're going to head to social media. I hear that you guys have some questions. Gary will be here all night. No. <laughs> <laughs> So this question comes from Brittany Byfield. Thank you so much for participating. And she asks, what can small businesses do to become listed on the stock exchange? Well, the first thing a small business can do is you need to, we, we keep referring to it as corporate governance. Mm -hmm. You need to run your business in a particular way. I keep, I've been introducing the term values in terms of you run your business. You have a lot of small business owners that rob their own business. Mm -hmm. And it's, they think it's funny to do that. Meaning you're taking money out of the business, yeah, sure. take money out of the cash register. You want to follow the proper principles so that by the, when you do that, the more transparent a company is, meaning the more you know about a company, is the more likely an external party would want to invest. So what is the stock exchange? The stock exchange is a medium where external parties 
will be brought to your business to say, okay, will you, are you interested in buying shares in this company? Yes. And the more transparent that company is, is the more likely that people will want to and buy it. The more into informed it. they are. Not only are they more informed, but it will attract more people to, to, to invest in your company. So that's the first thing that, that, that you can do. You have to run your business, keep the proper books, you know, have the right people, make sure your, your taxes are in place, mm -hmm. et cetera. You know, once you adopt that principle, you know, you're on the road to creating a business that one day could list on the exchange. Fantastic, fantastic answer. Lauren Millwood Morrison, thank you for participating. She asks, would you encourage a retiree to borrow against their property that is fully paid off or fully paid for and they have the title for it, uh, for home improvement or maintenance? Well, you know, is it, is it for the benefit of the retiree? And again, I'm trying not to make this a joke out of this, but you have some people who decide that they want to spend every dollar up to one minute before they die. Mm -hmm. so whatever they <laughs> accumulate, they want to spend it back, right? You know, um, so it depends on the mindset of, of that retiree. Right. You know, so you come back to the original, princi the original principle that I'm, I'm introducing. If, you, if you're going to borrow against that house, the question becomes, how are you going to repay it? Yes. So if that retiree has a stream of income, then that will determine how much they can borrow against that. Or home. if they should in the or, first or place. Or if they should, correct, if they should in the first place. All right. So I think that's the determinant. What they're, how, they, how will they be able to repay and how much they can repay? Mm -hmm. And the decision will be there. All right, fantastic. Rob Warren, Jamaican from IG and Shaq, Shaq Keenis. I'm so sorry if I mispronounce your name. What are some resources you would recommend to get startup capital and what generally influences the decision for financial institutions to give credit to a brand or a product? I think the first question is them, they mean sources as opposed to resources. What are some, sources, what are some sources, sources, sources you would brand. recommend to get startup capital, correct? I mean, obviously the first place are the, your peers. You know, nobody knows you better than your peers. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we all have somebody who we know is this bright guy from school and he has great ideas and I'm honest. Yeah, <laughs> that's know. important. So, um, you know, that's, that's one of the first places. I mean, obviously, in selling an idea, you're trying to sell yourself and your character as well. So the people around you are the ones who will be able to make, a, make, an establish, they make a decision on you and your character. The second key point is, depending on the value proposition, mm -hmm. you can go to more structured places. So whether it's to a venture capital, a private equity, or ultimately a bank, you know, um, these are some of the key places Options. you go. But the beautiful thing, I mean, or not the beautiful thing, the key thing you need to, you need to focus on is that value proposition. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, if a guy comes and he says he wants to get into the business of heel tips, um, you know, you might, some people might not know what a heel tip is, you know, and how many, is, is it a market for 70 million heel tips in the country? Right, correct, correct. You know, um, or he could come with this great idea that, you know, he's going to create this, this app that is, you, you don't need to do anything else in life. You just go on this app and you do everything for yourself. So that idea is going to be very important to, to, to really attract people. So, you know, you now have angel companies, mm -hmm. you have venture capital companies, as I said, you have private equity and stuff, so you can, you can focus on them. All right. But the second question, I forgot. Uh, the, the, the second question was, um, what are the influences? What are some of the, the, the things that the, the, ability, the, 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 the institutions, institutions look that's, at that's an in order to handle that's the actually, capital to that's the actually brand a, product? That's actually a very excellent question. Um, and it depends on different people. Uh, I think one of the key things is the character. You know, if you, you can see the passion, you can see the intention. And sometimes if they don't have some of the other things, you know, a, 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 a professional can take a risk on that. The, the ultimate answer, though, is the ability to repay. Mm. You know, so what people, and to be fair, I mean, whilst I'm not a commercial bank, commercial banks get a really bad rap from time to time in the sense that a commercial bank is not designed to take risks. A, a commercial bank's resources to lend comes from your deposits and, and, and other people's deposits, right. right? And so therefore, they have their fiduciary responsibility is to protect that deposit first. So when they lend people to money, they lend it. They didn't gift it. They're supposed to get it repaid. Absolutely. So they have to, in, lend, in that decision to lend, they need to convince themselves that it will be repaid. You know, so obviously that they the, will get that return that on investment. Will, correct. So 
you know, the, 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 the reality is that you have to put forward sources to suggest that you can repay it this way. And that's why some of the criticisms come in, because the bank is going to say, hey, I want a personal guarantee. Mm -hmm. I want your house. I want you this. I want you that. Because they've had bad experiences with people that, you know, you, you lend the money to, and they just don't give you anything. Absolutely. All right. So Dilcio um, Bulli, or Bully, depending on how you pronounce it, uh, for Webinar Jam asks, what are some ways small business owners can help to make sure their business, uh, their business is financially able to withstand external shocks like those that popped up in 2020? So what are some ways small business owners can help to make sure their business is financially able to withstand external shocks like those that popped up in 2020? Obviously, cash sales and a lot of the small businesses I see that blow up, mm -hmm. um, they're taken advantage, advantage of by their customer who asks for credit. And you know, in trying to pursue the sale, the business provide the product on credit and they're just not being paid. So most businesses go bankrupt, not because they can't sell, but because they run out of cash. You know, so the, the simple answer to that question is, you know, manage your cash, watch your cash, make sure you have enough cash. Uh, you know, sometimes you will see a sale that looks like you need to do it. But if you think you'll have an issue collecting, don't do it. Don't. It is, it's not worth it. It is better you keep the product there and try and find somebody else that will take one at a time. Rather than you know, it jeopardize yeah. or compromise so, the actual stability. So focus on cash sales. And I think that's one of the biggest things that you can do. Fantastic. This is a very general question. What's your top stock pick for the day, Gary? Uh, you mean outside of Mayberry and what SPL? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, Mayberry does a forum every Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, just concluded our, we just concluded our forum. And um, I think they, and it's a position that we've taken recently, which I've disclosed. Um, so that's Grace Kennedy. So Grace Kennedy has been around for a while. Mm -hmm. um, they have exp they've, they've made some investments overseas, but I think they have now finally gotten it correct. Okay. And in the last quarter, they, they produce significant profits. And for, for, for a so-called mature business that is now seeing double-digit revenue growth as well as double-digit profit growth, um, I think they're in a good place. And the final reason I like Grace Kennedy is that Grace has usually had anywhere from 30 to $35 billion in cash sitting on its, its balance sheet. And at the investor briefing, I was pleased to see Don, Don, who's the CEO, indicate that he's looking at some acquisitions because <laughs> Grace has been, you know, usually a little quiet in that right. side of thing. And they have been acquiring some stuff and putting that cash to work. And I think once they have some really good additional acquisitions, they're going to do very well. And the final reason is that it's at a relatively low PE. Well, Gary, for saying that, I'm just going to call my financial advisor right after this comes to an end and say, you know, we got to do, we got to do, to that, we got to do some it. investment for sure. And Grace Collar is red too. But there you go, my five million dollar chest. <laughs> Gary Fair, CEO, Mayberry very Investments. Thank you so very much You're for welcome. your time. You gave us more than 60 minutes, and I'm sure the brothel is extremely appreciated by everyone else. I hope you enjoyed it. If you, if you have not registered yet, please go to digitalbusiness.com and register. It is absolutely free. We look Look forward to seeing you next week, Thursday at 6 o'clock, same time, same place where we speak to our next master, Chris Williams, Managing Director of Proven Investments. More Money Moves. See you next week. Thank you for joining us.